one second, some technical issues here. Let me just make sure the live stream is up and going. Sure. Right, yeah, it is. Let me just get uh, more people here. And let me post the link. And with that, I think we can get started. So welcome everyone to the Shavalsky Horse Cloning Webinar. Uh, with me today, I have Dr. Oliver Ryder joining us from all the way in California, the San Diego Zoo. So everyone, please welcome him. Um, so we're just gonna go ahead and get started with my part of the presentation, which is going to be a short background on the Shavalsky Horse. So first, we're going to start off with um, this quick agenda. Uh, I'm going to cover the history uh, of conservation of the Chevalsky horse, the recent developments in this conservation, and the results of all of these efforts. Then we're going to go into an interview with Dr. Ryder. And then finally, into an open Q&A where the audience can ask questions directly through the chat. So we're going to start off with the history of the Shabalski horse. And if you see a QR code on the screen, we will be accepting donations 50-50 uh, with the uh, San Diego Zoo and the Revive and Restore project. Um, you don't need to donate. I'm glad you're here anyways. So we're going to start off with the Shabalski horse uh, with their anatomy and biology. They're a very short and stocky horse and they're the only truly wild horse left in existence. Um, funnily enough, unlike the tamed horse, they have 66 chromosomes instead of 64, which is going to come in later. All right, next we have the Shavalski horse's behavior and society. So the Shavalski horse, like many other horses, are social creatures. They travel in herds. Um, there are two major types of herds, first one being the bachelor herd, uh, whether it's a all male herd, uh, they travel together in search of females to breed. 
and there's also a the more, co more common herd which is composed of like a family unit with one leading male and then a bunch of other stallions and other horses so they're very social creatures they have a very organized society and next we're going to go into the discovery of the Shavalsky horse so humans have known about the Shavalsky horse for centuries now um, but this knowledge has been has been uh, limited to only one area which is that of Mongolia uh, since they live mostly in the steep hills of Mongolia and also um, some parts of Eastern Europe. Um, uh, proof of that is the cave paintings that are found all over the Mongolian steeps. So as we can see on the screen, uh, people made paintings of this short and stocky horse. We also have records of monks that often talked about seeing this horse in the wild. And then the introduction of this horse into the modern world was done by a Russian explorer known as N.M. Shivalsky in the 1870s. So thanks to him, the contemporary world got to know about this horse. So then we have a, an extinction in the wild, in quotes, uh, of the Shivalsky horse due to hunting, climate change, and capturing. See, the Shivalsky horse was hunted for, um, for sport and also for its luxury meat and also it was hurt by the climate as the areas it could live on shrunk because of uh, climate change. And so the areas that it could live off with grass and short trees um, died out, meaning the population shrunk to the point where the horse was practically extinct in the wild. Now this led to the capturing of the horse for breeding programs, as we can see in this image. Um, so from the 1960s to around the 1980s, the horse was thought to be completely extinct in the wild until we captured them for breeding. And um, we captured around 12 horses, which were all bred into the thousands of Chivalsky horses that are present in our society today. Um, so there is a very large need for genetic, genetic variation uh, when it comes to bringing back the Chivalsky horse and reintroducing it into the wild. That way we avoid in breeding between horses and make sure they're a healthy species in the future. We also have the modern breeding programs which are found all over the world. Um, for example, we have Mongolia, China, places like Tibet, and notably the USA, which is what we're mostly going to talk about today. Um, so these breeding programs uh, take in horses, uh, allow them to breed, raise their cattle and eventually once they have enough horses they can release them back into the wild in herds so that they can um, repopulate the environment and fill in their environmental role um, additionally there have been other developments which relate to the horse which i will talk about later these programs can also trade horses with each other to ensure that they have enough genetic uh, variability in each program to ensure that these horses are not inbred, which would obviously hurt the species. All right, next we have some recent developments within the last year of the Shivalsky horse, um, in that they were cloned, two of them actually, using a technique called a somatic cell transfer. So this somatic cell transfer starts with two, uh, two animals of the same species. One is a somatic cell donor, and the other is the egg cell donor. So the somatic cell donor gives the nucleus, basically the DNA of the animal, and the egg cell donor gives an empty egg cell where the nucleus is removed. Then these are put together to make an, an embryo, a full complete embryo with a complete um, DNA sequence. And then eventually this is grown in a petri dish of sorts uh, to ensure enough cells are present. And eventually this is put into a sur surrogate mother um, in the uterus of a surrogate mother, which then raises the child in uh, her uterus until it is birthed. And now this birth animal is the exact clone of the somatic cell donor we see here. So fun fact, this was actually the exact same process done to the sheep Dolly, the first ever animal of her size that was ever cloned. Um, and we are using it now to clone the Shivalsky horse. So as you can see here, these two are direct clones of each other.
Now, first in the year 2020, um, the first Cheval C horse was cloned. Um, its name was Kurt, uh, named after Kurt Ber uh, Bernersk, who passed away in 2018, who was, uh, carries a large legacy of genetic research relating to the horse. Uh, he really backed the San Diego Zoo when it came to the conservation of this animal, and he backed up efforts to clone it eventually. Um, Kurt is currently trying to learn the wild language and behavior of the horse from um, the ho other horse, Holly, which you can see in the picture there. Um, and Kurt's DNA actually came from the frozen zoo of San Diego, which collects DNA samples um, of older animals to eventually um, bring them back in the future if they do ever go extinct. Now, that was the first horse from August 2020. And now the second horse was cloned named Ollie after Dr. Oliver Ryder himself. Um, he was born in February 17th, 2023. Um, he is still not open to the public because he's very young and he still needs to learn the language and kind of social um, abilities of his species. Um, and he also needs to grow up and learn how to be a horse, sort of. Um, now, these two horses are genetic clones of each other. They are the exact same genetically, um, thanks to them both coming from the same genetic sample. Now, why would we do this? Well, as I mentioned earlier, the Shavosky horse almost died out completely in the wild. This is known as a genetic bottleneck. This means that a lot of genetic information was lost completely from the horse, um, which is a big problem for conservation efforts, right? Because when you don't have enough genetic material, you risk inbreeding horses once you start um, breeding programs and the like. So bringing back genetic material, like the one from the frozen zoo, which was not present in the um, current genetic pool, would really help scientists and conservationists like Dr. Oliver Ryder bring back the horse in the future through these techniques. Now, this brings us to the results of this, um, the results of this uh, conservation efforts. Now, thanks to these conservation efforts, we have seen over a thousand Chevalsky horses uh, alive today. Um, some in the wild that have been released thanks to uh, breeding programs in Tibet, Mongolia, and China, as I've mentioned before, and loads and loads in um, captivity in breeding programs, hopefully to be released once again, once we have a large enough population of them. So the conservation efforts have been successful thus far, but one big problem that we face is the lack of genetic diversity. And because of that, we see the cloning of Kurt and Ollie. Now, this brings us to our interview with Dr. Oliver Ryder. All right, so I can pull up my interview questions now. Okay, great. So, uh, Dr. Ryder, just to start off easy here, um, what got you into your line of work and why did you get involved with the cloning of the Shavasi horse specifically? Sorry, I don't think your mic is working right now. Uh, no, not yet. Can you hear me? Sorry, guys. Technical issues here. Um, you can try. Let's see. If you go into your mic settings, uh, you can choose a different microphone system. Like it's next to the microphone symbol. Uh, Not can, yet. Oh, there we go. You can hear me. Perfect. Now. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Great. So I'm going to repeat the question just for uh, the sake of the audience here. Um, 
so what got you into your line of work and why did you get involved with the cloning of the Shavalsky horse specifically? Well, thank you, David, for the invitation to your webinar. And I appreciate your interest in the conservation of the Shavalsky's horse and all of those who are watching this. Um, well, basically what got me into my line of work um, was curiosity. I've always been, I've been interested in how DNA uh, uh, can carry out its its functions and be the blueprint for guiding all the activities of the cell and the development of a multicellular organism. Um, there's a long history of uh, involvement, my involvement with the Pshavalski's horse, beginning with uh, being mentored by Dr. Kurt Benershka, the founder of the Frozen Zoo, and the person who showed that uh, Pshavalski's horses have 66 chromosomes, whereas all domestic horses have 64. Um, thank you. Well, yeah, that's great. Um, thank you for that. Now, next, uh, I would like to ask you a follow-up question to that. So what got you to study biology? I know you have um, a bachelor's and a PhD in the subject. Well, it was, uh, I was very interested in chemistry and mm -hmm learning that biology um, was more and more uh, involved the analysis of the chemical uh, world that it occurs in cells, um, that piqued my curiosity. And when I learned as a high school student that the, the DNA molecule was the uh, blueprint, it ordered all of the activities of the cell, including um, being able to uh, provide the program for the development of an organism from a single cell. All life begins as a single cell. Some of it stays a single cell, but uh, multicellular organisms, all of them begin life as a single cell. And that uh, process fascinated me and all of the steps that have to take place um, are still far from uh, unknown, uh, are still far from known. So there's just a lot to learn and I've always been curious. Right, of course. All right, thank you for that. Now, would you like to tell us about your experiences at the San Diego Zoo um, with conservation as a whole? Well, I've worked here for a long time and, um, but I uh, started my career at the zoo because I wanted to uh, work on uh, on helping endangered species. And my background was as a, a molecular biologist, as a researcher. And so I had the opportunity to explore what, uh, what could be done uh, in that realm. And genetics turned out to be a very powerful um, and important tool for uh, assessing, monitoring, and managing endangered species. Wow, uh, that's great, yeah. Now, as someone deeply involved in this project, what do you think has been your most significant learning or takeaway from the experience? And how has it shaped your views on conservation and the role of genetics as a whole? Well, um, one of the things that's just had an impact is a continuing fascination. Uh, my office has been close to the frozen zoo for many, many years. And I walk by the, uh, the storage tanks that are cooled by liquid nitrogen and think of all the cells that are in there from, from thousands of different animals. And now to be able to go and visit Kurt and Ollie and see an actual animal, living, breathing animal that's derived from those banked cells is a, is absolutely, continues to absolutely fascinate me. Um, the long history of Chivalsky's horses, which you outlined, all Chivalsky's horses in the world today uh, trace their ancestry to 12 individuals. Um, 11 of those came out of the wild at the end of the uh, 1800s. And so they have a long history of breeding in captivity. 
the last horse, the Chevalsky's horse to come out of the wild came in 1957 uh, in Mongolia. And, um, uh, but that's the, that's the, con that's the basis for the gene pool for the species is those animals. But over the long history of breeding them, a lot of genetic diversity has been lost when they were first brought into uh, Europe and other places and uh, uh, obtained by individuals and zoos that wanted to breed them. There was no notion about their eminent extinction in the wild or what conservation breeding would manage, uh, would, would, what, what conservation breeding would involve to preserve their gene pools. So approximately half of their genetic diversity has been lost. So it's very important to preserve that which is left. And that's done by managing breeding programs to minimize the loss of genetic diversity, genetic variation. But that still takes place. All we can do is hope to slow it. But now with the possibility of cloning animals, we can bring back genetic diversity that's been uh, brought to a low extent, a low frequency, a rare event in the gene pool, or to even restore lost genetic diversity. And uh, that's, that's an unprecedented opportunity in the history of conservation. Yeah, that truly is amazing. Um, we have been able to kind of expand our reach with conservation as a whole. Um, could you tell us more about um, the frozen zoo as a whole? Well, the frozen zoo is a collection of cells. It's different kinds of cells. It's somatic cells, as you pointed out. These are cells that make up the body <clears throat> of an organism. And it's reproductive cells, uh, the cells that contribute to the formation of, of, of embryos, so sperm and eggs. And uh, over the years, over uh, 11,000 individual animals, uh, these are uh, mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians, have had their cells banked in the frozen zoo. And many of these species have become rare, or we even have a couple of extinct species in the frozen zoo. And the only thing that's left of, of these species is the cells that are in the frozen zoo. For species that haven't gone extinct, we may have genetic diversity that's no longer present in the wild population, but that would be useful for, for uh, providing resilience uh, to the current population and sustainability. So a prospect for the future is to um, learn whether this technique of, uh, of genetic rescue, we can call it, um, is uh, how applicable it is in the conservation realm. But one thing that's for sure is it won't be able to be accomplished if we don't bank cells. You can't make an animal from DNA. Animals are made from cells. So we have to have cells to start this process. Right. And how are these cells collected? They're collected in a variety of ways. Uh, when an animal comes into uh, a zoo from another place, it's often given a medical exam that provides an opportunity to collect a sample. And um, uh, when animals are transferred between institutions, there's a chance to collect a sample. And when an animal dies, there's a chance to collect a sample and uh, grow the cells up and uh, uh, bank them in a way that they can be then resuscitated and resume their normal growth. Wow, really? So you're just constantly throughout the animal's lives and kind of collecting their genetic information? Yes, we we add about 300 new uh, animals a year uh, to the frozen zoo. So over 40 years, that's how we came to the numbers we have today. That's great. It's kind of like insurance, I guess, for the future of these animals. Well, it would really be great if that would work out that way. Mm -hmm. We don't know for sure. What we do know is that the cells in the frozen zoo from the species that are there, there's at least one individual from over 5% of all the critically endangered species that are listed in the Red Book of the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. There the Species Survival Commission Red List, it's called. So that's mm -hmm. a remarkable accomplishment to have banked 5%, but that means that 20 times as more have not been banked. So I think that's one of the most urgent opportunities of our time 
and an activity that can clearly benefit the future is by expanding efforts to bank cells. Of course, of course. Now, coming back to the Chevalsky horse, why is this animal specifically so important to its environment? Well, the Chevalsky's horse has a long history on the planet. We know that it was, uh, it probably diverged from uh, its uh, uh, closest related species, the domestic horse, the ancestors of domestic horses, because horses were only domesticated about 6,000 years ago. Um, uh, according to the latest scientific knowledge, but Chivalsky's horses and the ancestors of domestic horses have been around for hundreds of thousands of years. And they uh, evolved in their environment and um, occupied different places um, in, in, the, uh, in the landscape. And um, so uh, they carry out the function of being grazers um, you know, before there were domestic cattle or domestic sheep, there was a wide variety of species that, that uh, ate grasses and small shrubs, and they were sculptors of the landscape. So that's what, uh, that's one of the things that Chivalsky's horses did. Right. So there aren't that many other grazers present in their habitat? Well, nowadays where where the Chivalsky's horses are being reintroduced, you know, only in recent years, there was a lot of grazing of domestic animals there mm -hmm. um, because people uh, wanted to, you know, have as many domestic animals as they could uh, to uh, ensure their, their, you know, food for their families and increase their, their, their fortunes. And right, so that competition marginalized, you know, uh, push Chivalsky's horses into less favorable uh, uh, places where the uh, people who do, were doing the grazing uh, would prefer not to go because the food quality wasn't as good for their animals. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you really have to find the right balance of kind of domestic animals and the truly wild horse that is the Chivalsky horse. Um, Okay, so moving on, can you walk us through the cloning process that's used for the Chevalsky horse? Um, I know I kind of covered a little bit of that in my presentation, but um, what kind of technological advancements have you made uh, that made this possible? Well, I think you did a good job of, dis of describing uh, somatic cell nuclear transfer cloning, David. Uh, in the case of these Chevalsky's horses, um, a, uh, this was accomplished by a partnership between Revive and Restore, which you've recognized, and the world's largest commercial cloning company, Viagen Pets and Equine. Viagen Pets and Equine has previously cloned domestic horses, and they, uh, um, it was considered that they would certainly have the expertise to clone a Chivalsky's horse. So a domestic horse egg uh, had its uh, uh, genetic material removed, and into that was inserted a cell from the frozen zoo from a particular individual that we chose um, for reasons that I can explain uh, in a minute, um, and that produced a an embryo, and those embryos were cultured and then transferred into domestic horse surrogate mothers. So the first clone for Kurt, it was an American quarter horse that received the embryo and gestated Kurt uh, until he was born. Um, and, um, and so that was a very remarkable event because prior to that in the history of the species, the long history of the species, all Pshavalski's horses were born to a Pshavalski's horse mother in a, in a group of Pshavalski's horses. And in this case, Kurt was born, uh, um, and the only other horse present was uh, the, the domestic uh, uh, horse who was his gestational surrogate, and he didn't have a herd of animals to uh, be in. So that's why it was important to be sure he got um, kind of uh, early training in being a Chivalsky's horse by introducing him to others. And the same is true for Ollie. 
Wow, that's really interesting. Um, I guess is this only for um the Shavalsky horse, or can other species do the same with like related animals? Well, other cloning efforts have involved relatives of cattle. So mm -hmm. domestic uh, cow egg, cow ova, cow eggs have been used for cloning relatives of uh, wild relatives of domestic cattle. And recently a, uh, a domestic ferret was used, eggs were used and domestic ferret surrogates were used for cloning black footed ferrets, a weasel like animal that was critically endangered in North America. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, and so you collect samples from the frozen zoo and then use those um, kind of as the DNA basis for the uh, animals once you put them in the surrogate mother. Wow, that's great. Um, but one of the concerns with cloning is the issue of genetic diversity since you're reusing the same genetic data. Now, how does the cloning of the Shavasi horse kind of address or compound this concern, especially considering like the limited genetic pool of the existing population of the horse? Well, there are existing programs to preserve the genetic diversity of the managed population in zoos around the world. Because in the 200 years of breeding Chevalsky's horses, they are now present in, in zoos throughout, uh, throughout the world. But the breeding of those horses is organized in a way to minimize inbreeding and maximize the retention of genetic variation. So there are, based on theoretical guidelines in population biology, there are software pipelines that help identify which animals are the most appropriate to breed. And we could use that, uh, those uh, algorithms, those, those uh, uh, tools, those programs to select animals for breeding. And in the case of the cloning, we could say, well, what if a cell line from an animal that's dead, what if that animal were alive? What would that animal, how would that animal rank in the, in the selection of, a, of, an, of individuals to breed? And the uh, cell culture uh, that produced Kurt and Ali came from an animal named Kuporovich, who was born in 1975. A sample was taken from him as 19, um, uh, he came to the United States in 1978, and the sample was taken from him and, and added to the frozen zoo in 1980. So for over 40 years, um, cells uh, sat in suspended animation until they were thawed and sent to Viagen, Pets and Equine to do the cloning. And, and that individual who we chose to clone uh, when we ask the question, what if this animal were alive, he would be the top male to breed with any female in the world. Wow. And did this animal not get to breed while it was alive? Or He had very limited breeding and his ancestral population. So if you look back at his parents and his great grandparents, they left relatively few, they have relatively few offspring in uh, a lot of uh, descendants, I mean, relatively few descendants uh, in the world today. So that in the algorithm that's used, that increases his desirability and rank. That's really interesting. How do you um, analyze how related, I guess, this horse is to other horses in the population? How, rela how related what? Uh, the original horse that you cloned um, to other horses in the population. Yes, we have all of that information. And how do you gather that? Well, we can do it through pedigree analysis because there's what's called a stud book. So um, in, in uh, zoos that kept the horses and uh, private owners that kept the horses uh, kept track of uh, their breeding records. And we know, uh, so we can assemble the pedigree and from the pedigree, we can uh, determine the, the extent of relationships, whether individuals are, you know, um, half siblings or cousins or third cousins or great great grand parents and that kind of thing wow so this science right is used commonly 
um, throughout other species, I assume, as well? Especially for these uh, programs that are part of intentional management to preserve their gene pools. They're called species survival plans. Mm, great. All right. Now we can move on to the kind of ethical side of this conversation. So to start off with, uh, do you think the cloning of the Shivalsky horse was ethical? And what does ethical mean to you? Well, we wouldn't have done it if we didn't think it was ethical, David, but I'm glad you asked the question. When you look at what is what does it means to be ethical, you, you ask questions like who benefits? Is somebody making money off of this? Uh, is somebody doing this so that they can be uh, um, famous or, um, you know, gain some kind of recognition or prestige or use it for purposes that, that have nothing to do with the animals themselves or who might be harmed? Um, you know, are there, is there harm to a gestational surrogate? Um, uh, questions like that or why do this? And when we analyze those questions, I mean, the, uh, the opportunity to benefit the long-term sustainability of the Chivalsky's horse population, you know, recommends it, recommended us trying this out. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's still an experiment really, because the, the payoff comes when these clones reproduce and restore genetic variation to the population that's been gone. Right, as you said, um, we started off with only a dozen horses and um, now we've cloned, not cloned, we've bred um, hundreds more. And so, so far efforts have been really successful. And with the cloning of the Shavalsky horse and reintroduction of more DNA, um, we can see likely more success in the future. So. I think that what the best intention we have is to restore Chivalsky's horses back to living in the wild as natural populations. And if they were, if they were removed from the wild, which, you know, actually saved them from extinction, but if, if, they, if we as humans remove them from the wild, it's appropriate that we put them back and it's appropriate that we put them back with the whole gene pool, as much of it as we can, to give them the best chance to survive in the wild, because that genetic diversity is their is their uh, molecular resilience. Yeah, of course, that would be working ethically to ensure the survival of the animal. Now, what are the primary ethical considerations when you're cloning a species like the Shavalsky horse? I know you kind of touched on this a little bit, um, but how do you balance the potential benefits against like the risks of, uh, for example, inbreeding? Well, if I think that I would say if we're going to do a good job of cloning, we're not going to make, we're not, we're going to be able to uh, argue that the animals that are produced by cloning have a benefit for the population. And so it wouldn't, we wouldn't make uh, animals that were somebody's favorite we wouldn't clone animals because they're somebody fav somebody's favorite, or we would clone animals because they have a role in preserving the uh, future, uh, the future of the of the species. Right. In recent years, we have seen a lot of cloning for um, sport, if you will. Um, for example, people can get their pets cloned now. Um, just out of a way to preserve them, I guess. But obviously that's only working for personal interest and you're not really working to better the community as a whole. All right, so next question. Reintroducing species, including those that have been cloned into their native habitats can have unforeseen impacts. For example, competition with the, next, with the species that um, kind of took over the role um, while the species was gone. Um, what steps are taken to ensure the reintroduction of the Shafosky horse? Um, and how does the, we ensure that this does not negatively affect the ecosystem? Right. Well, there are really not any places in the world where people aren't, where humans aren't making impacts. So one of the things that has to be done is um, 
uh, involved the local communities and indigenous people uh, in the area where uh, uh, where a reintroduction effort might be considered. Um, and another point is that um, we wouldn't want the horses who have been in a different environment when they move to a new one to introduce diseases. So um, that can involve, you know, extensive health checks of the animals uh, to see if they have any communicable diseases can, uh, that could affect uh, domestic horses or be spread to other animals. And that's a kind of a routine procedure in, in animal transport among zoos anyway. So that's a very important uh, um, aspect. And, um, and I think that the, the other part is, is the habitat that they're going into one that they're likely to thrive in. So is there, is there suitable grass, for example, if it's the grazer, uh, are there water supplies? Um, are there, is there natural shelter uh, um, uh, with rock formations and so forth, or the kind of things that would, would benefit their uh, survival in the wild? And, uh, and again, um, uh, that they, uh, that any competition for resources like grazing land, that that be um, agreed upon uh, and that, you know, if there are impacts on the local communities, that they get some benefit from having this reintroduced species now in their uh, historical uh, homeland. Mm -hmm. Do you ever have to take legal action to ensure that this land is, is kind of saved for the horse? Uh, you know, the reintroductions in China and Mongolia, those legal actions take place, you know, within those countries. Um, we, we don't, we, we really can't influence it as outsiders. We can ask that they make legal protections for the animals in their country as a, as a, as, you know, uh, as part of their contribution to the program. Right. Now, has the San Diego Zoo started to reintroduce these animals back into their native habitat? Or are we still in the process of breeding horses? We have, we have been breeding Chivalsky's horses for decades, and we have sent horses to other facilities who have bred them and sent their descendants back to the wild populations. Wow, that's great. So you're kind of a source of kind of genes, I guess, and... Uh, DNA for other programs. It's interesting. I guess you can say that. Yeah. Okay. So now, looking ahead, do you think further cloning of the Shavalsky horse will be effective? Well, I think so. Um, but I, I'm a, I'm a pragmatist. Um, Ollie and Kurt have to prove themselves. Mm -hmm. um, they need to grow up and become mature stallions and have the attributes that a successful herd stallion has. And, um, uh, uh, but, but, uh, but I'm very optimistic. They're both amazing animals. And it's really, uh, I'm still staggered when I see them and, and to see how they look great. They're, you know, they're doing very well. And um, I obviously hope that, that that continues and it'll be a big you know, celebration when they, uh, when they reproduce. And, and over time, you know, their descendants will um, contribute to uh, herds of you know, increasing the genetic diversity of herds of Chivalsky's horses around the world and including in the, in the reintroduced populations. So are there plans in the future to, if this algorithm that you mentioned earlier kind of says to do so, to clone another horse from a different genetic batch? I would say definitely so. But I think that, you know, some people might think, oh, we're going to do that next year. We may not need to do it for a decade. But if we have the gene pool of Chivalsky's horses banked as cells, and those are secure and can be kept safe, this can be done over and over again over centuries. Right. This is really a long-term issue. 
So now looking even further into the future, um, how might the success of this cloning project influence future conservation efforts and cloning efforts um, for other animals? Well, the way to save species is to save functional, you know, viable populations in their habitats. That's the first principle. We are working with, you know, in the case of Chevalsky's horse, a species that went extinct in the wild. We are better conservationists. We are better stewards. We serve the species and, and the future of nature better if we preserve functional ecosystems with viable populations. But we are facing an increasing rate of extinctions. And the uh, if 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 when species become uh, uh, small, their populations decline because of changing environmental conditions like climate change or because of diseases uh, uh, that have been, that are uh, that have impacted populations, um, then we may be able to address the harm that's been done uh, about to the population um, by using this kind of technology. But it will only be able to be used if we bank cells. So I okay. think that the, uh, the, uh, the future, the immediate impact of these of this cloning and showing how cloning can be helpful should be to stimulate more efforts at biobanking and having cell banks like the frozen zoo set up in countries around the world. Is the frozen zoo being used for any other animals at the moment? Well, we I've mentioned the black-footed ferret. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been used for that and it's been used in cloning two species previously. But the Chevalsky's horse is uh, uh, the you know the one that's right now got the best uh, chances for um, you know making the most progress for restoring lost genetic variation. Mm -hmm. Great. Now we only have a couple. I only have a couple prepared questions left, so I'm going to start opening it up to the live chat. So anyone that's watching right now is welcome to uh, put a question in the chat, and I will read it out as a sort of Q and A session, I guess. Um, and so my next question had to do with a sort of kind of different topic, which is um, I read an article about the interbreeding between um, domesticated horses and Shivasi horses and how they produce viable offspring despite their different chromosome numbers. Do you have anything um, to say about that, like any experience or anything like that? Well, that's been a well-known phenomenon, and um, that occurs in many species where there's gene flow, we call it, between them. In the history of Chevalsky's horses, there are, in addition to the 12 Chevalsky's horses in the pedigree, there are several domestic horses that have uh, uh, participated, you know, whose genes are now in the gene pool. But, um, but the but Chevalsky's horses are still identifiably distinct from domestic horses, still have 66 chromosomes, and still represent a long legacy of a species that's been here for uh, many thousands of years. Right, right. So even with the introduction of this domestic horse DNA, um, these horses are pretty much the same as a normal Chevalsky horse? Well, you know, the closer we look, there may not be any normal Chivalsky's horses. You know, before they went extinct in the wild, they may have been having some gene flow from domestic horses because uh, in the region where they lived, you know, there was extensive uh, uh, husbandry and use of domestic horses. They had to have met up with them. Mm -hmm. Of course. Yeah, that's great. All right. Now we're gonna open it up to an open Q&A session with the live chat. So first I have here a question from Gerald Arroyo Jefferson. Um, he says, thank you for the great information. My question is, what is the best way to explain the significance of cloning endangered species to the public? 
and encourage their support for these efforts? Um, I think there's two answers to that. And thank you for the question. One is to do kind of what David has organized here is to talk about how the cloning effort can help provide resilience and sustainability to populations of species that have gone through genetic bottlenecks or decline or even become extinct in the wild. And the second way is to see these animals alive, to see as visitors to the San Diego Zoo Safari Park can look and see Kurt, uh, you know, grazing in his habitat and see that what a, you know, what a magnificent animal it is and realize that his presence required a lot of human, uh, at human effort to, uh, to, uh, to bring him to, to, uh, to clone him, you know, because he's, he's basically genetically identical to an animal that uh, existed 40 years earlier. Um, and that, that this is something that in the world where gene pools are shrinking and species are declining in number, uh, uh, this I think is a hopeful, uh, a hopeful possibility. Right. Um, I meant to ask this earlier, but how do these programs receive most of their funding? Mostly by zoos fund them. Mm -hmm. And these zoos receive, you know, revenue from um, people attending and also donations, of course. Yes, I mean, many of the zoos are municipally supported, get money from the, the city in which they're located. And many zoos uh, are, are, are private nonprofit corporations and um, they make their, uh, they carry out their conservation programs uh, because of revenue they make, you know, um, uh, through admissions and through sales in the gift shop and food sales and through donations. Mm -hmm. That's great. So um, I'm gonna interject here with a little bit of a self-promotional thing. So if you scan that QR code on the top right of the screen, um, you can donate to the program if you wish. Again, these funds will be split. 50-50 with the San Diego Zoo and the Revive and Restore project. That way we can continue this uh, cloning project and conservation project. All right, next up we have a different question from Alexander Sargi. He says, thank you for speaking to us. I know you had mentioned earlier about the frozen zoo and how some extinct species have their legacy in there. Will there ever be efforts to revive those extinct species? I wouldn't want to say no, but I don't, I think that that's a really um, a fraught question, a question that's loaded because who would benefit from it to produce, for one of these endangered species, it's an extinct Hawaiian bird, the po'o'uli. We received uh, a sample from the last male and cultured cells. So we have living cells of this bird that's now extinct, uh, lived on the island of Maui in the Hawaiian Islands. And what would, what would be the benefit for bringing back an individual that had nobody else? Mm -hmm. I think that that's, um, I think that's a grave question. Now, there are things that we can learn. I think it's worthwhile uh, establishing and freezing cell cultures from species like that. Because the many of the birds in the Hawaiian Islands are now threatened with extinction from an introduced disease, avian malaria. Mm -hmm. uh, 200 years ago, there were no mosquitoes in Hawaii. Then people brought in mosquitoes. And then a, a bird was brought into Hawaii. We don't know when exactly and what kind of bird, but it must have had avian malaria. And the mosquitoes now living on the island uh, uh, were able to extract blood from that bird and then uh, infect other birds. And it caused the extinction of many, many species. So learning more about the process of the resistance 
or the tolerance to avian malaria could really benefit other endangered species in Hawaii. And um, the po'o'uli could play a, a, a role um, in learning about um, uh, how the disease uh, susceptibility or disease tolerance uh, uh, has arisen uh, in, in the birds of the Hawaiian Islands. So you would say it's ethical to sort of bring that animal back to do research? No, no that's not what I'm saying. I say sequencing its genome mm. will give us insights. I, I don't really, uh, it's not possible to clone birds at the moment, but if it is, I wouldn't be a proponent of bringing back the po'o'uli. Uh, uh, I don't see how it would uh, help. I don't see how it would help the bird, and I don't see how it would help us. Right, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so we have, we are running uh, low on time, so just one more question here from uh, Kit Ham. Would it be ethical to preserve extinct species cells for the purpose uh, to clone the species later if their ecosystem or natural habitat disappears in the future? Well, that's a good question and a controversial subject. I feel like that given the circumstances, I would say the urgency of the current situation, bringing back extinct species would not be as high a priority as devoting efforts to prevent species that are now here from going extinct. But at the end of the day, it will be people in the future who decide about this. And I do believe it's important to give the future options for us not to decide, oh, this is what the future will want. So we're doing this now and we're for closing options for you. I rather think that the best thing we can do is give as many options to the future as possible and um, let their let their wisdom uh, apply to the six circumstances. And now just to finish this off here, how do you feel realistically the future of the Shavasi horse um, will look like? I, I'm, I'm really optimistic because now we have the tools of, of genome biology to identify uh, 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 the, uh, where, the, where there are deleterious mutations and we have a program of managed breeding and we can, um, if, the, if, a, if a disease were to come and wipe out some of these, uh, uh, reduce some of these reintroduced populations, we have the chance to restore their genetic diversity uh, through the processes that have produced uh, Kurt and Ali. Um, you know, hopefully uh, that that that's uh, one of the benefits of this work that's being undertaken right now. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think that will be it for today. Thank you, Dr. Ryder, for joining us. Um, I think that's time. So. I'm going to stay on the meeting for a little bit longer, just leaving the QR code up. Uh, so thank you everyone for watching and for joining in, listening to our uh, talk and webinar about the Shabalski horse. Um, if you need to contact me, uh, that is my contact information on the slide. Uh, the at horse cloning is the Instagram and the information sheet for this webinar is in the link at the bottom. So thank you everyone for joining us. and. Please, everyone, thank Dr. Ryder for taking time out of his day today uh, to join us here. So thank you, Dr. Ryder. I think you are good to go. I'm just going to stay on, on, on here a little bit longer. Okay. Well, I'll say thank you and bid, bid everybody a good evening. All right. Thank you, everyone, for uh, listening today. Uh, I'm just going to leave this QR code up for a bit, and then I'll close the stream.
All right, now that it's 8 p.m., I'm going to close down the stream. Thank you, everyone, for joining, and um, have a great day.